Court of Justice. All right. Please take your seats. Caribbean Court of Justice Appellate Jurisdiction on appeal from the Court of Appeal of Guyana. CCJ application number 8 of 2018 between James Ramsahoy versus Linden Mining Enterprises and Bauxite Industry Development Company Limited and James Ramsahoy versus National Industrial and Commercial Investment Limited. Can we have, they have their appearances for the court, please? Thank you. Your Honours, I appear together with Mr. Narayan Chakram and Mr. Ron Mukilal for the applicant. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honors. If you please, Timothy Jones appears for National Industrial and Commercial Investments Limited. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, commence the hearing, I'd just like to welcome our new judge uh, on the bench, uh, Justice Andrew Burgess. It's a welcome addition to our bench, and uh, I'm sure will help us deal with these procedural problems and jurisdictional problems we have this morning. Now, remember, you have uh, 60 minutes each, with the appellant having a right of reply of 10 minutes, so we want to keep to those uh, uh, limits. And um, we can commence, I think, with the jurisdiction under Section 8 of the CCJ Act and the CCJ rules. Uh, that seems to be a matter that should be relatively short, so we have more focus, I think, on the other issue and the powers of the uh, so of a single judge uh, of the Court of Appeal. So, uh, Mr. Satram, would you like to begin? Yes, please, Your Honor. Well, I would also like to join in congrat congratulating Mr. Borges on his elevation to the CCJ. I believe this is the first case um, in which we appear before. Your Honor, we <clears throat> essentially rely on our written submissions. Um, but I would like to emphasize a few points. If Your Honor will permit me, I would like to deal with the procedural issue towards the end of my oral presentation. <clears throat> Your Honor, at the center of this dispute is the final order made by the Court of Appeal on the 3rd of March 2004. This controversy concerns the enforcement of that order. And the enforcement of that order has, Your Honor, been the source of a dozen further proceedings. Nittil was joined in these proceedings by an order of Justice Cummings Edwards, as she then was, made since July 2004. Um, Mr. Satram, I think it might be easier if you sat, actually, you'd be nearer the microphone, yes. so all could yes. hear you better. Can you do that, please, and see if it does improve matters? Yes, please, Your Honor. I lost my voice over the weekend as well, so that's proving a little bit. I hope it's not an indication of any excessive conduct on your part, Counsel. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, Your Honor. Right, so you're saying you've been trying to enforce this 2004 judgment, and it does yes. reflect very badly, I think, on the efficiencies of the uh, judicial system, that here we are almost 15 years later, um, well, we are 15 years later, and we still haven't got a proper enforcement of the order, just partial enforcement. So you were yes. trying to get that enforced by the sole judge of the Court of Appeal. Yes, please, Your Honor. You see, it didn't start there, Your Honor. 
the Justice Cummings Edwards, as she then was, added Nissil as a party to these proceedings in July 2004. And there's never been an order setting aside her order. And we say by Order 15, Rules 4 and 5 of the High Court Rules. And, and based on Section 6.3 of the Order um, <clears throat> 45 of December 2003. Of the dissolution order. Yeah. Nissel was automatically um, joined as a party in the proceedings. But even more fundamental than that, Your Honor, is that since 2004, Justice Cummings made this order adding Nissil. Nissil has been aware of that order since 2004, and it has, has never set it aside. Well, it's actually now, paid money over as well, hasn't it? Y yes, please, Your Honor. Over an extended period of time. The other um, thing I wish to highlight, fact I wish to highlight, is that in 2009, Justice Bobbill Drakes charged monies held by Nissil in Republic Bank to secure the payment of accrued pension due to the applicant. Nissil appealed that decision and applied for a stay of execution, <coughs> but stay was refused. The applicant in these proceedings filed an application by way of summons into in both appeals the concluded appeal, that is the number 69 of 2001, and the pending appeal by Nissil, that is appeal number 56 of 2009. And your honors will see that application at page 105 of the record. <coughs> what Justice of Appeal Roy essentially did, your honors, um, is that he refused to stay thereby clearing the way for the um, enforcement of the order made by Justice Drakes. And he basically ordered Nissil to comply with the judgment, the final judgment delivered by the Court of Appeal on the 3rd of March 2004. And implicit in that order of Justice Drakes was a determination that Nissil was bound to pay the pension. Because when he ordered Nissil to pay the pension, he essentially determined that Nissil was bound to pay the pension. And by the, at the time he made that order, Nissil was already added as a party in the proceedings by an unchallenged order of Justice Cummings Edwards. Yes, so that's on 14th of August 2009. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the, the order was made, <clears throat> by which time, as you say, many years had elapsed since Justice Cummings' yes. order, right? Yes, and the, the refusal of the stay basically meant that Nissil had to pay up the pension. Now, the decision that Nissil must keep the payment of the pension out of its funds is the subject of the pending appeal number 56 of 2009. And with respect, Your Honours, this court cannot hold that Nissil is not obliged to pay the pension, because that question is yet to be determined by the Court of Appeal. Now, the full bench of the Court of Appeal felt that Justice of Appeal Roy had no jurisdiction to make the orders he made. And in our submission, respectful submission, the Court of Appeal effectively stultified itself because the final audit made 15 years ago is now not being complied with. And that is why I opened the appeal, Your Honor, by saying that these proceedings are essentially enforcement proceedings. That is what they are. Although you have made rights. some progress in enforcement, hadn't you? Because you've yes, got please. this um, uh, charging order against funds held by Nissel. And this will actually paid over, I think, 36,582,784 Ghanaian dollars, pursuant to that. Yes. 
we, we, after great effort, Your Honor, we were able to secure um, partial compliance. But, but that appeal has yet to be heard, hasn't it? So we can't yes. actually deal with the charging order at the moment. We need to await the no. Court of Appeal determining that, subject to a possible appeal to us, of course, thereafter. Yes, please, sir. That is the submission I just made, because that issue is the subject of the pending appeal. And unless the Court of Appeal deals with it, your honors have no jurisdiction to deal with it. That, that, uh, what, <coughs> what, Mr. Satram, what is the position on that appeal? What is the status, apart from it being it is, pending? Is there a date well, for the hearing? No, no, please, your honor, not at the moment. As far as you it know, is, what has delayed it? Well, I can't say, Your Honor, these interlocutory proceedings have been pending for some time. But um, there's nothing in the way of it being hard, as far as I know. What about possibilities of expedited hearings in view of the fact that almost 15 years have elapsed, and of course Mr. Ramsahoy is in his 80s, getting older and older? Yes, well, Your Honor, I can't really see why. Um, it has not been set down for hearing, but we are always willing to have the cases heard, Charlie. But um, <clears throat> on the jurisdiction issue, Your Honor, <clears throat> we'd make two simple points, uh, which I think we've already made in our separate submissions, and it is that. Um, Justice of Appeal Roy was faced with an abusive process in enforcement proceedings. He found that there were a multiplicity of proceedings, all aimed at resisting payment of the judgment. And he felt that the judicial process was being abused, and he endeavored to put an end to the abuse. He felt that he had an inherent jurisdiction to do so, which is correct. And he did so by ordering compliance with the final order of the Court of Appeal made in 2004. Uh, Importantly, Mr. Your Honor, Mr. Satram, uh, where do you yes, locate sir. that um, inherent power exercise you said by um, the judge? Well, it is, it is not a statutory power. It is not derived from the statute. And based on the cases beginning with Cocker and Tempest, um, it is a power which resides in every court to protect its, its process. One of the earliest statements of the principle is contained in Cocker and Tempest, which is before your own. And it is a jurisdiction to, to ensure that the court's process is not being abused for injustice. I understand, but I, I gather yeah. that the argument on the other side is that yeah. that's a power that inheres in the Court of Appeal, not in a single judge sitting in chambers. Well, as I understand the rule, Your Honor, it is a power which resides in every single judge, whether he's sitting in chambers or as part of a larger bench. It resides with every judge because it's, he, he was sitting essentially, Your Honor, and exercising the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeal. But, uh, counsel, was that jurisdiction at large, or was it uh, circumscribed by the provision in uh, Order 2, Rule 161? Well, it is completely outside of Order 16, Rule 2. How could it, it is be, inherent. How, how could it be when the powers and jurisdiction of a, of a single uh, Justice of Appeal is carved out of the Court of Appeals general jurisdiction and is defined in Order 
to Rule 61. How could, how could it? You see, Your Honor, I understand what you're saying. But the, the question is, does Order 2, Rule 16, strip a judge of his inherent powers to protect the courts from an abusive process? And the answer is no. But with respect to the two counsel, sorry, yes. I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt you so often, but is a justice of appeal a judge as such? A judge other than is permitted under 16-1? Is he a judge in the sense that a high court judge is a judge? Or is he part of a panel who, which part has been separated out for special purposes designated in 16-1? No, well, he is a judge of the Court of Appeal. And his jurisdiction in our respectful submission, his inherent jurisdiction is not circumscribed by Order 16-2. His inherent jurisdiction exists outside of that provision. And in any event, Your Honor, Order 16-2 is not an exhaustive provision. If you look at Section 26 of the Court of Appeal Act, you will see that there are powers listed there, powers given to a single judge, which are not found in Order 2, Rule 16. There are different powers specified in Section 26 from those mentioned in Order 2, Rule 16. And based on our understanding of the case... Could you help us with this Section 26, please? I mean, do you have it at hand? Yes, yes. Could you read it for us, please? It's at page 295 of the record. And what does it say? What does it say? The side note says that... What does the provision say? Yes, the side note says powers which may be exercised by a judge of the court. And Your Honor, you'll see that there are some powers there, particularly at C, 26-1C, the power to assign legal aid to an appellant. 26-1E, to admit an appellant to bail, etc. Those are not powers which are specified in Order 2, Rule 16. Order 2, Rule 16 does not mention that a single judge has those powers. So clearly, clearly, Your Honor, 16-2 was not meant to be an exhaustive provision. And in any event, our submission is that the inherent jurisdiction as established by the cases exists outside of statute. Your Honor, the Court of Appeal, the full bench of the Court of Appeal felt that they were bound by their earlier decision in Commissioner General and Caribbean Chemicals. But in that case, the majority judgment was delivered by Justice of Appeal Roy. But that is not a case which dealt with abuse of process and the powers of a single judge to put an end to it. The case simply established that a single judge could not determine the appeal in the sense that he could not reverse the orders made by a judge at first instance. They felt that that was a duty reserved for three justices of appeal, the full bench of the Court of Appeal. And in this case, 
Justice of Appeal Roy didn't purport to do what Justice of Appeal Ramson did in the Caribbean Chemicals case. He did not purport to determine the appeal against Justice Bovell Drakes. The question of whether Nisil is um, bound to pay the pension, etc., can still be established in the appeal which is pending. Justice of Appeal Roy essentially affirmed um, what the Court of Appeal said in 2004, that is, that the pension must be paid. And secondly, he basically affirmed the orders of Justice, of Justice Cummins Edwards, as she then was, and Justice Bobbill Drake, that the pension must be paid by Nisil, and that the assets of Nisil stood charged for that purpose. So Nisil, up until now, is still free to establish that it does not have to pay the pension. But what Roy, Justice of Appeal Roy did, is he recognized that tremendous judicial resources were being used to deal with what essentially were enforcement proceedings, and that an end should be put to the abuse. Now, <clears throat> on, the, on the procedural point, Your Honor, um, we had applied for leave to appeal as a right. So, excuse me, Counsel, are you leaving that, that uh, point that you were making in respect of uh, the exercise by Justice Appeal Roy in granting the orders that he did? Are you leaving that point? Yes, we are. Yeah, but could you, could, you quickly, yeah, could you quickly uh, uh, help us to understand uh, you said he had an inherent uh, 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 power. Uh, the, the, sorry, the inherent jurisdiction of the of the Court of Appeal is inherent insofar as it comes directly from statute. Because unlike the High Court, the Court of Appeal derives its jurisdiction from statute. And this is elementary law. So that, yes, the Court of Appeal has the Court of Appeal, the full Court of Appeal, has inherent powers to ensure uh, that its jurisdiction is properly exercised. This, however, uh, is not available. This inherent power is not available to a single Justice of Appeal, unless, of course, you can, you can con convince us to the contrary. Well, the, the case um, which was referred to in our submissions in reply, Narayan and NBIC, Justice Chancellor Bernard, as she then was, said that when a Justice of Appeal sits in chambers, he exercises the powers of the Court of Appeal. That is why but she, but she, but didn't she go on to say she, he, he exercised the powers of the Court of Appeal within the four corners of the orders which were permitted, uh, which he was permitted under uh, the relevant uh, 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 rule in 16.1? Yes, because she was not dealing with his inherent jurisdiction, but the point she was making, if I remember correctly, is that because he exercises the powers of the Court of Appeal, his decision was not appealable, it was reviewable. Yes, this, is, this, is, this, is pursu this is pursuant to, se to Section 16.2, se se but that doesn't, that doesn't uh, respectfully uh, help us to, to find an in inherent jurisdiction in a single judge in the way that you have uh, suggested. Uh, if I may, just quickly, I'm certain that you're aware of um, the fact that um, provisions similar to the Guyanese uh, 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 rule 
are to be found in various Commonwealth Caribbean jurisdictions. Uh, and I'm also certain that you're aware of the cases in Jamaica and Trinidad and uh, Guyana, which um, all interpret Section 16.1 and sections in part material with Section 16.1 as a very limited, very uh, 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 highly circumscribed jurisdiction. Yes, Your Honor, I understand all of that. The, our simple submission is that it is a power which inheres in every judge, every judge. You see, Your Honor, it, it, it would make sense if every judge were to have that power, as has been recognized by the cases since Cochrane and Tempest in, I believe, that was a decision of 1841, that they would have a jurisdiction, an inherent jurisdiction, not one given by statute, to put an end to an abusive process because the policy is the policy is, has always been, that the abuse of process must be put to an end. It cannot continue. In this case, we have 12 proceedings, 12 proceedings which came after final order. If that were to be the case with every single um, final order, then the legal system would be tremendously burdened. The applicant was saying that expended up to the time he filed his summons, sixty thousand United States dollars, and years of effort <coughs> in dealing with the what were basically interlocutory proceedings, following a final order. So our simple submission, Your Honour, is that the power inheres in every single judge. It is not. It is totally out with. Um, the act and the rules. But Mr. Satram, how far can abuse of process go? Can we really, are you suggesting, use that to uh, prevent there being any appeal against the charging order, for example? Well, surely we must well, let that run its course. Well, it can be. I've cited some um, cases which show that the judge even has the power, there's a decision by Lord Wolf. the judge even has the power to put an, to stay the appeal, to stay for the proceedings. But in this case, Justice of Appeal Roy didn't do that. He allowed the appeal to run its course, but ensured that in the meantime, the pension was paid. Your Honours will see the case of um, E. Burton, Benville, where Lord Wolf spoke about staying any further proceedings as part of the exercise of that power. But in this case, our submission is that Justice of Appeal Roy did a very reasonable thing. He affirmed what were essentially orders, orders that were essentially made by the High Court. <coughs> An order that Missile be joined and an order that Missile pay the pension and that its assets stood charged for that purpose. And he allowed Missile to establish in their appeal that they didn't have to pay the pension or perhaps that they were wrongly joined. Those are questions which he left open. It was open to him in exercise of his inherent jurisdiction to put an end to the abuse by staying the, all proceedings. Council, one last, one last question from me on, yes, the, on this matter. Yes. Uh, yes. As, assuming, assuming that Mr. Justice Appeal Roy had the inherent jurisdiction as alleged by you, as argued by you, sorry. Yes, please. Wouldn't the exercise of that inherent jurisdiction be subject to order 2, rule 16.2, which empowers the Court of Appeal to vary any order 
made by him, whether he has jurisdiction or not. Very or discouraged. Am I wrong in understanding that power has been expressly invested in the Court of Appeal? No, 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 Your Honor, you're not wrong on that. The, the full bench can definitely review him. But in this case, they didn't even recognize that there was an abusive process. In discharging his orders, they just thought that he had no jurisdiction. Um, and for that reason, they discharged the orders he made. But he could have been wrong that there was an abusive process, in which event he could have been reviewed. But the Court of Appeal didn't go down that route. The Court of Appeal simply said, we are bound by precedent, and for that reason, we discharged the orders. They did not recognize what was really happening, which is that 15 years later, they are dealing with proceedings which confirm, concern the enforcement of an order they made, a final order they made. <clears throat> Your Honours, on the, on the procedural point, we made an application for leave to appeal as of right under Section 6A of the CCG Act, and it was refused. Following the refusal, we filed within 21 days this application for special leave to appeal. <coughs> As we understand Rule 10.12 of the CCG rules, <coughs> we have um, that provision specifies two instances, or contemplates two instances in which special leave may be sought from the CCG. And it is the time within which the application must be made. The first instance is where an applicant is allowed to apply directly to the CCG within 42 days of the decision of the Court of Appeal. And the second instance is where an applicant is allowed to make an application for special leave to appeal within 21 days of being refused leave to appeal by the Court of Appeal. And that was what happened here? Yes, Sri sir. And we are saying that the right to apply for special leave after the refusal of leave by the Court of Appeal is not premised on an erroneous refusal of leave to appeal by the Court of Appeal. Once leave has been refused by the Court of Appeal, the right to apply to the CCJ arises and it expires 21 days thereafter. That is how we, we construe the provision. Your Honor, the, if I may say this to end, um, the applicant is now 82 years old. He has spent the last 20 years trying to secure his pension and other benefits. And Your Honours must be mindful of the likelihood of him completing or seeing the end of any further proceedings that he may have to take at this point in time. This thing has to be brought to an end. We can't continue for 15 years dealing with interlocutory enforcement proceedings. It does not look good, if I may say so bluntly. It does not look good for the judicial system. What is the likelihood of him seeing the end of further proceedings? <clears throat> Costs are being incurred. The system is being burdened by repeated applications, all which concern the enforcement of a final order. And exceptions have to be made to deal with this sort of abusive process. 
exceptions have to be made if the integrity of the judicial system is to be maintained. The wrong signals, Your Honor, Your Honors have to be careful not to send the wrong signals. The judgments must be obeyed. Unless there's anything else, Your Honor. When, when, you, say, when you say that exceptions have to be made, I, I wasn't quite sure in what sense you meant that. Are you saying that um, exceptions have to be made in the sense that in a case like this, the inherent power of the court has to be exercised? Is that the way you Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Yes, please, Your Honor. I'm sorry if I spoke loosely, but the, the court is not powerless. The court is not powerless. Once we recognize that judicial time is being wasted, that these proceedings constitute an attack on the final judgment of the Court of Appeal, that they are really a frustration of the enforcement of a final order, your honors have no choice but to act if, if you are to protect the integrity of the judicial system. Help me here, Mr. Citron. Sorry. Are you finished? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please, Your Honor. Um, since the application for a stay has been refused, what stops the applicant from enforcing the unstayed order for payment? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> that order has already been enforced, Your Honor. Okay. You will see the order, the order at page 271 of the record. Right. That's the order of Justice Bobbitt Drake. Right. At page 272, you will see, remember this pension is being incurred monthly. Right. You see that there's an application as at the 22nd of November 2007, charging the sum of about $25 million. It is 25261098. But by the time the charging order was made absolute in August 2009, the sum then due had increased to $36,582,700. Five hundred eighty-two thousand seven hundred forty-eight dollars Right. So the, the order effectively charged um, the monies of Nissil to that amount, up to that amount, $36 million. Right. It did not charge. It did not charge the monies of missile for the future payment of of pension, the pension that had not yet been incurred. So this order has been has been executed. Right. But what stops? What stops that same order, pursuant to which the charge was made? from also being employed to obtain payment of the future pension or of the of the accruing pension well you see the order is not um very clear on that your honor it is silent on that and we will be met by the further objections the same objections that we are being met with now that missile is not bound to pay it, that missile is not a proper But, 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 but hold on, but hold on, like that. that, that's an argument, whereas you have an order. The argument is against the enforcement of the order. But until that argument is given root, until a stay is granted, as I understand it, <coughs> nothing stops enforcement of the order. Yeah, but the question arises as to whether it it deals with the future pension. Sorry, you're, you're saying it, it is at 295, 275? Yeah, 271, and it continues on 272. Hang on, let me see if I can find that. It deals but with money. The charge accruing. order, I gather, are respect to monies accruing to 30th November 2007. It doesn't extend beyond that date. 
So you no, say you need to get up. a new charging order to cover future yes, that, payments. That may be so, Your Honor. But the order of Roy J.A. Um, extended it to all, to all pensions, all pensions. Yeah, but more, um, I, the I, order I, says specifically is hereby made absolute in the sum of 36 million, etc., in respect of monies accruing up to the 31st of July, 2009. That is what it says. Yeah, um, let, let, let's just work on this. I am at 271. Yes, sir. Sorry, 272, this is where there's a charging order. And yes. it is hereby ordered that the order NISA issued on 22nd November 2007, charging the interest of NISIL in the sum of 25,000, um, is made absolute, etc. Now, the charge for the 25,000 is in enforcement of an order found where? There you go. You don't have the information. I didn't get that. Too. Yeah, the, the charging order for 25 million mm -hmm. is enforcing an order for a judgment found where? Which page? Uh, no, it, it's, it refers to the order of the Court of Appeal made in March 2004. Okay. The, there's no written judgment. All right, the order, for, the order for the Court of Appeal, is that order drawn up? Yes, Your Honor. Right. And what does it say? That is, is to be paid a monthly pension beginning from 1998. So that's the, the point. What, 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 what stops that order being enforced? Well, Your Honor, that is what we've been trying to do. Yeah, and I'm asking you what stops it. There was an application for a state of execution that was refused. Yes. Therefore, that is a state of execution of this order. Yeah. And this order says that it stood, the monies of Nisil stood charged for $36 million. But money is accruing up to the 31st of July. Right, I, I, I understand that, and I am coming back to the order of the Court of Appeal for the payment of a monthly pension. Yes. What stops that from being taken into force? There's nothing, Your Honor. All of these proceedings have been aimed at enforcing that order. And so so Nissan when... is refusing to pay the pension. Therefore, your only recourse is a charging order, you're saying. Against all monies held by this. Yeah. Or what about that, possibly the garnishee secret. order? Mm -hmm. Yes, but when Justice of Appeal Roy made the order he made, Nissil began paying the pension, and it has been paying the pension for years, up until when the Court of Appeal discharged the, discharged the order, and Nissil stopped paying. We write back to where we were in 2004. Mm -hmm. This is a pain. It's a simple question of getting this to pay the yeah. money. I mean, is there not a possibility of specific performance of the pension? I think there was a case, Beswick and Beswick, 1968 appeal cases in England that dealt with that sort of issue. I'm, I, I apologize, Your Honor. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know the case. Um, could I have the Name, I guess. Well, it's you know. called Beswick, B-E-S-W-I-C-K. But essentially, we, we, I, I, I sympathize with, with the approach of Roy J.A., but it does seem relatively clear in the light of, uh, you know, Section 6.3 of the order of uh, 2003, that the liabilities have passed to NISA, uh, and also the assets have passed to the government, government assets held by NISA. So it does seem only just and fair that Nissel pays up the money needed uh, for this pension, albeit obviously a defendant is entitled to take uh, legitimate points uh, of defence, but there seem to be relatively few of those available. You see, all we are saying, Your Honour, is that 
The parties and the, the judiciary has been struggling with enforcement for a decade. And Roy J. A. recognized that. He chronicled all the troubles that the judiciary and the parties were faced with in trying to enforce the order. And he made an order which sorted out the problem. And they have paid. They have paid years. When his order was discharged, then we went back to square one. We were right back to 2004. Yeah. Well, so, we, 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 we see your points and see the merits, I must yes. say, I think. But um, are, are those your final submissions or are there anything else to us? Yes. M much obliged, Your Honor. That would be it. Thank you very much. So, um, Mr. Jonas, and uh, I'd like to see you are now senior counsel. Congratulations on that. Well, sir, I wish I could say thank you, but um, there has been some political issues involving that, and it was actually taken away. <laughs> oh, therefore, sorry. <laughs> therefore, according to my very, according to my very good friend Loku, who called me the next day, he said, "I hear you are appointed and disappointed." <laughs> <laughs> That's like. That is a, that is a story. I'm glad you can laugh about it. <laughs> it's it's a story for another forum, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've heard my friend's argument, and I've heard the court's response, and during that exchange, the one item that has hit home to me is that the court has not been armed with all the background information that surrounds um, the issue with which we are now confronted. And the applicant, through the ingenuity of my friend, has gone to some measure to play on an emotional appeal without paying too much deference to the legal issues which arise. Now, with great respect, I understand empathize and, and have always led from the forefront in the approach of a court to try to do what is just, try to do what is fair um, within the corners of its jurisdiction. And I see that the court here, and you'll forgive me from presuming um, to make inferences from, the, from your questions asked so far has a point of view, but with great respect, um, I believe that that point of view may be born of insufficient information um, or perhaps incomplete information. Your Honor, Mr. Little Body Corporate. <clears throat> Mr. Ramsoy was employed by two companies, one of which produced bauxite and one of which produced milk, Litco and Litco. He was employed back in the 70s and 80s. And he was dismissed by those two companies in circumstances that I don't think um, bear discussion here. He therefore took proceedings against those companies, saying that he was entitled to a lump sum of money and he was entitled to be paid a pension. He failed at first instance and he appealed. Your Honours will observe that nowhere in my recount so far has Nissel appeared. Nissel, a body corporate, in 2001 was given some property. It was given assets under an order made under the Public Corporations Act, which had been held by Bidco and Lidco, the two companies which were at the time embroiled in <coughs> Apple litigation. Nissel has not appeared, does not know, had nothing to do with the litigation at first instance or on appeal. Nissel is a company that receives some assets. And it's the subject of Section 6.3 of the order of um, number 45. So all the liabilities pass to Nissel because I assume um, the assets pass to the government and one of the government's assets is Nissel. And so Nissel, uh, having received benefits, 
uh, is subject to the burden. Your and that's in, in, a statutory, in a statutory order. And hence, there was this order made by Justice Cummings Edwards joining Nissel, so that Nissel has become a party uh, by that well, order, me, if not directly a party, by virtue of the order anyway. Forgive me, sir. Um, the orders, in, on my construction of them, provide that Nissel may be joined as a party in pending proceedings, but, that, but those are, on my interpretation of them, send the liabilities of the company directly to NISO. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, and this is why I draw that distinction, at the time, there was litigation. There was no liability. In fact, the order at first instance had exonerated the two defendant companies. And the order says that NISO may be joined in where, pending where, where, where is the order, Counsel? Your Honor, I'm embarrassed. I am trying hard to follow what is politically correct and go paperless. And right. I am woefully inadequate Record in that 18. regard. 187. Thank you very much, Judge. Can I borrow it? Can I borrow 187? Can I borrow the order. Thank If I can refer you to page 186, please. Your Honor, we'll see it, paragraph 4, subparagraph 4. No, 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 sorry, sorry, my, my mistake. I, I have that. I meant the order joining Nissel as a party. Ah, thank you, sir. Yeah. That's that, page 197. Let me keep it. Yes, please. Now, Your Honor, the sequence of events is very interesting here. After the Court of Appeal allowed the appeal on the 3rd of March 2004 and made a judgment against Litco and Bitco, so after those appellate proceedings were determined in favor of Mr. Ramsoy and judgments were awarded by the Court of Appeal against Litco and Bitco, Mr. Ramsohoy, through counsel, Mr. McKay at the time, went to a judge in first instance, in the first instance proceedings which had been determined some time ago. Ex parte, so this is didn't know, and obtained an order that Nissel be named as the defendant in this proceeding where there was a pre-existing judgment no enforceable against whoever was named as the defendant. So Nissel's first information of this whole thing was to be notified that, guess what, it was a defendant named in proceedings started long ago, in respect of which a judgment had now been granted. Right. Yeah. Has, that that order, has that order been set aside? Well, Your Honor, this is what happened. That order was made in July 2004, right. three months after the Court of Appeal judgment. Yeah. Right. In sometime after that, Nissel became aware because in September, it was served with levy proceedings to enforce the judgment. Okay. And in in those levy proceedings, which was before Justice Bobby Drake's, Nissel for the first time was able to appear in court and say, "This is wrong. Please hear me." Right. Now, I've, I've heard Justice, Justice Hayton's question, making the observation that Mr. has paid this money. Right. But, Your Honor, <clears throat> Your Honor, I wish to make the observation, please, with great respect, that Nissel didn't let us file voluntarily put his hand into the pocket, its pocket to pay the money. Nissel paid under compulsion right. of the charging order. Yeah. So when Nissel, <clears throat> when Nissel challenged what was done, having now been aware, now been brought into the loop, and acted, acting promptly, saying, this is wrong, please revisit this. They were rejected by Justice Bobble Drakes, who made the charging order absolute, and appealed. And in that appeal, they asked for a stay so that they could be heard in the appeal, and the normal um, variables involved in an application for a stay were involved. Sorry, so, you're, 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 sorry, sorry, Counsel, just, just for clarity. The appeal, which is still pending, seeks to discharge this order for 
their joinder? The charging order made by Justice no, 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 Bubba no, Green. No, 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 not the charging order. The order of Justice Coming Edwards in Chambers on the 28th of July 2004. This year was joined by that order. By an ex parte process, yes. Please. Right. Therefore, the question is, has, is there pending or has there been an application to discharge that order, to unjoin missing? Your Honor, I was not there at the time, and I don't want to misrepresent the position to you. But I can say to you that one of the factors before Justice Bobble Drake dealing with the charging order was to impugn that very order joining NISA to say they should not have been done. Mm -hmm. So whether it was frontally dealt with by a specific application to discharge or whether it was done as a corollary argument to say this was bad and needs to be set aside, I, I cannot represent to you now. Right. But the question, the question is as a matter not of what took place in the course of the hearing, but as a matter of record, this order is not the subject of any appeal. Your Honor, I, as far as I am aware, it has never been frontally challenged in the way that Your Honor mentioned, yeah. but I don't know because I was not on record at the well, time. Well, then, Counselor, is it not the case that we must proceed on the basis that this is a valid and subsisting order? Yeah. Your Honor, and it does seem based, uh, Mr. Uh, um, Jonas, on Section 6.3 of the order, which and presumably Nissel was well aware of that order. All proceedings commenced prior to the appointed day, which covers these proceedings, for the enforcement of any rights or liabilities in favor of or against the company may be continued by or against the Nissel, and any such proceedings may be amended accordingly. And uh, Justice Cummings Edwards did so. After the conclusion of the proceedings. Yes, uh, Consul. Uh, Consul, uh, Consul you, you are giving us bases for impugning the order. I understand that. I see in your submissions, your view is that Nissil was not joined. But this says Nissil was joined. So I'm trying to get very clear, so I do not mislead myself later on, that there is no existing challenge to this order for joinder. And Your Honor, from the bar, the most complete answer that I can give is inadequate that I was not on record at the time, and I'm not aware of a frontal challenge, and you but there was a peripheral. You but, cannot, you but cannot no point us to anything? No, please, sir. Not right. anything frontal, okay. except the peripheral challenge which was made. But, Your Honor, I, I wish to make this observation, and this was my opening comment, please. Okay. What before this court is a challenge to the finding of the Court of Appeal that Justice B.S. Roy, sitting as a Justice of Appeal in Chambers, made orders that he had no jurisdiction to make. That's what is before this court. This really? court, yes. yeah. this court is very understandably seeking to go all the way to the beginning of the story. But as, as I said in my opening remark, this court has not been given all of the material in order to cut through the Guardian knot and do justice. So what is left before this court and I say with great respect, is not an issue of sympathy, it is an issue of law. Did Justice B.S. Roy have the jurisdiction to make the wide and extensive orders he made? And if he did not, can the full bench of the Court of Appeal be impugned in its determination coming to the conclusion that he did not have that jurisdiction and therefore setting it aside? Your Honor, all of the other issues which are being raised, which, which go to whether Nissel must be compelled now to pay every month, because it has already had to pay the lump sum. And for the last nine years, it has already had to pay monthly pension installments to a gentleman that it never employed. Must that, that ancillary question, with great respect, cannot be for this court. I'll make the observation, please, sir, that in considering whether a stay should have been granted, Justice Bob Eldrick, as, as my friend pointed out, his charging order spoke to the lump sum. Justice Bob Eldrick's charging order did not go to the future pension payments. 
There's a reason for that, in my respectful view, and, and we are now outside of the scope of what is before the court respectfully, but allow me please to embark on that. If the judgment debtor charged with payment of monthly sums had come to the court in nice simplified proceedings to say to the court, please for a stay of this judgment, because every month that I make a payment, there is an accumulating balance to be repaid to me in the event I succeed. There is authority from our local court of appeal, Sankar and Sankar by Justice Claudette Singh, that says this must be treated as an exception. If the increasing balance that you pay every month on a judgment, when that judgment is overturned, we can't be sure that you'll be repaid. Justice cuts two ways. So allow me please to ask rhetorically, given that Mr. Ramsohai was paid $35 million under a charging order made by Justice Bob Eldrick, and given that Nissel has been compelled by this order by Justice Roy, made without jurisdiction, to pay several thousand United States dollars every month for the last nine years, if at the end of the day, in this pending appeal, the court says, your appeal is allowed, you are right, do we calculate those several thousand dollars times 12 months, times, times 10 years, times the next three years that the court may take to decide it? And are we certain that Mr. James Ramsoy will be able to repay that. No, Your Honor, that is not before you. Well, that's right. So there are no monthly payment orders here. Your Honor, with great respect, that's exactly what is here. The reason I do, I was not before Justice Bob Eldrick, but I am trying to place myself very presumptuously in his shoes. I believe that the reason his charging order said, here's your lump sum money, but his charging order did not include the future monthly payments. Mm -hmm. I believe that the reason for that was recognizance of Sankar and Sankar. Right, right. So when, when for the first time this came up before Justice B.S. Roy in Chambers and Justice B.S. Roy said, we will ignore all of these questions of the four corners of my authority under Rule 16 and I will order you to pay, it's, it's three or four thousand dollars a month, I can't remember this. Two. two, two something, two, two odd. For the rest of Mr. Ramsoy's life going forward, I will not give a stay. Your Honor, not only did Mr. Justice B.S. Roy go beyond his jurisdiction, and not only did he ignore the specific exception which Justice Claude Singh pointed out in Sankar and Sankar, where there is an increasing monthly balance, so that that is a ground for a stay of execution, but he ignored what Justice Bob Drake had specifically imposed as a limitation. None of that is before this Court. So what is before this Court is this question. Did Justice B.S. Roy have jurisdiction under Order 2, Rule 16 to make this myriad of orders that he made? And if Mr. Justice B.S. Roy did not have the, that jurisdiction, isn't it correct that the full bench of the Court of Appeal was correct in finding he did not have that jurisdiction? And therefore, can this Court, with great respect, impugn the decision of the full bench of the Court of Appeal that's said very simply, without anything more, Justice Roy had no jurisdiction to make those orders, we're setting it aside. Should this court sitting here today embark on a consideration of whether Justice Bob Drake was right to limit his charging order to the lump sum which has been paid and not to extend his charging order to future payments? Should this court sitting here now consider the question of whether $2,000 odd a month for the last 10 years together with that lump sum payment may not, under the rule in Sankar and Sankar, which has not been argued before this court, justify the grant of a stay which Justice B.S. Roy ought to have made? Or should this court confine itself to say, look, I don't have all the facts, what I have before me is part of the facts. There are obviously many variables involved here, but Justice B.S. Roy couldn't have made the argument. And therefore, we urge the full bench of the Court of Appeal to hear everything else and decide this thing quickly. But at this stage, Your Honor, Nissel has paid 36 million, Nissel has paid 2,000 a month because of Justice B.S. Roy's order for the last 10 years. So, so Mr. And Thomas, what is outstanding before the full <coughs> bench? What must the full bench do? And, and, and uh, when will the full bench do what they have to do? Your Honor, we are so far from what we should do. But let me please to answer your questions honestly as I can in terms of what we should do. We should, many years ago, have heard the appeal from Justice Bob Eldrick. Justice B.S. Roy, many years ago, should have said 
to Mr. Rappahoy, I have sympathy for you, but I cannot make the order beyond the charging order of Robert Drake telling Ms. Hill, who was not a party, to pay monthly amounts, especially given that I am bound by the decision of the full bench in Sankar and Sankar. But I urge you to go to the full bench to ask the full bench for some relief. Or Mr. Ramsoy could have appealed the order of Bob Eldrix, which confined his charging order just to the lump sum, and said, no, Mr. Bob Eldrix should have given us future payments, and we could have argued that. That is what should have happened years ago. But as it is now, Your Honor, Nissel having opposed before Justice Bob Eldrix, and having gone to the Court of Appeal to say, please give me a stay, I didn't know there were proceedings, I didn't know there was a judgment, I have been landed with a fate complete. And I am being required not just to pay $36 million now that I didn't know about, but to pay $2,000 US a month, forever. Please give me a stay. Could not have been responded to by Justice B.S. Roy with no pay everything and for pay future payments that Justice Bob and Ray didn't order. This could not have been faced with that. Yeah, but this has had an appeal against the charge in order outstanding for such a long while. What has this yeah. been doing? Nissel has been complying with the order, Your Honor, because Nissel has no choice. I, I wish I could go into the doors of, of the court to say, here, this thing now. But that can't be placed at the feet of Nissel. Well, Mr. Nissel Jones, let, let's look at the issue. There's no doubt that the Court of Appeal 2004 order is not being appealed against. So there was that effective final decision of the Court of Appeal back in 2004 in favor of Mr. Ramsahoy. Uh, but, of course, that was against Linden Mining and Bauxite Industrial Development. But in the light of uh, uh, what went on by virtue of Order 45 of 2003, uh, the government company Nissel takes over the liabilities of those companies. So it seems the other issue is, has those liabilities properly passed under Section 6.3 of Order 45 of 2003? So, A, there's an unappealed Court of Appeal judgment in 2004. There is Section 6, Subsection 3, uh, which has been invoked, and uh, Cummings Edwards J uh, amended the proceedings so far as it was necessary to amend, and there's no appeal against that. So, Nissel, therefore, is a party within Section 6.3 and therefore seems to be liable. That seems to be one line of, of possible argument. Uh, and if that is to be enforced, then you have to enforce it in the High Court. Uh, part has already been enforced under this charging order, but only with regard to existing sums. For, for monies after, whenever it was, November 2009, there will have to be further proceedings before the High Court uh, on the assumption that you're right that the sole judge of the Court of Appeal can't make enforcement orders. You've got to go back to the High Court. So that seems to be the the clear issues underlying all these procedural points. Your Honor, with great respect, everything that you have just said rests on information which is not clearly before you. It is one line of argument. I, 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 that's unimpeachable. I can't argue with that. But another line of argument may well be that when Nissel's appeal against the judgment of Bob Drake's comes up, the appellate court may well say Justice Bob Drake was wrong and ought to have considered what was argued before him, namely that Nissel was wrongly joined after the fact and that under or the order that Your Honor is referring to, under the Public Corporations Act, um, the liabilities of those two companies went to the government, not to Nissel. That is a possibility. It's an alternative possibility, but we don't know. What we are dealt with, dealing with here is the jurisdiction of Justice B.S. Right? Has these points you've just made been put in the notice of appeal to the Court of Appeal uh, relating to the charging order. So you're now introducing a new argument, the charging order must fail because Nissel were never rightly joined, albeit there Your seems Honor, to be an order that's never been appealed against way back in July Honor, 2004. Forgive me, I, I hope that isn't treated as a new argument. My argument in this court continues, it, it's what my first statement is, we do not have the full picture. But we do have a situation where there are arguments on both sides. But what this appeal to this court concerns is the jurisdiction of Justice B.S. Roy under Order 2, Rule 16. Your Honor, allow me please to read 
from page 186 of the order that was made under the Corporate Corporations Act. Two aspects are identified of the order. <coughs> paragraph 4, subparagraph 4 of that order says that subject to par subparagraph 5, all liabilities of the company incurred prior to and subsisting immediately before the appointed date shall stand transferred and vested in the government. On the next following page, at page 6 of section 3, it says all proceedings commenced prior to the appointment date for the enforcement of any rights or liabilities may be continued against NISL, and such proceedings shall be amended accordingly. Now, Your Honor, liabilities are dealt with, and proceedings are dealt with. Counsel, uh, respectfully, you, you've identified as the matter which is before us the question of the Court of Appeals treatment of Justice of Appeal Roy's decision in Chambers. But you continue to, to look at the matter which is now on appeal before the Court of Appeal, which is Nissel's liability. Unless you could help us to understand how that will help us in disposing of the, of the issue which you yourself have identified as the issue before us, unless you can do that. Uh, I, I am at a loss as to why we are, why we are dealing with um, uh, Nissel's liability. Your Honor, I will endeavour to answer that. Hard experience in this court has taught me that this court's policy is one which I, which one I, I empathise with and I endorse. That this court tries its best to cut through the guardian knot and to do the right thing and to end all litigation. Your Honours, in this case, a strong case of sympathy has been made to this court about Mr. Ramsahoy, who is in his 80s, and the background has been presented to this court in a skewed and imperfect manner. I am aware of the American approach of judge-made law, and I say with great respect, although I believe that the court must do its best to achieve an end result, in this case, I ask that this court acknowledge it does not have the material before it to draw definitive moral conclusions, to reach the sympathetic conclusion that my friend is asking the court to reach. So I entirely agree with you, sir. If we sanitize this and we talk law, Justice B.S. Roy had no jurisdiction. And the question of inherent jurisdiction, I don't think there is much discussion. And there has been no attempt to talk about abuse of process and define it in the language of Johnson and Gore and Woods. And I think if we were to define abuse of process, that also would not bear much discussion. So at the end of the day, Justice B.S. Roy did not have the jurisdiction to make the orders he made. Therefore, the full bench of the Court of Appeal was entirely justified to set it aside and say it didn't have jurisdiction. That is the end of this discussion, Your Honours. And, Your Honour, and with great respect, Justice Board, I may, may also welcome you and, and express appreciation that you've allowed me to answer this question. With great respect, that should be the end of a very simple legal transaction where we are concerned. But hard experience has taught me that that is not the end of the matter. And it should not be in most cases, but in this case it should be. Because this court is not equipped, it does not have the factual background, the factual knowledge to draw the conclusions which my friend is asking the court to draw on a sympathetic basis. And that is why I have to go back to say to the Honorable Mr. Justice Hayton, you are talking about what Justice Cummings did in an ex parte order making these people, uh, making this a party. Why didn't this appeal? I can't answer that, Your Honor. And it's not that I know and I'm, I am I'm hedging. I cannot answer that because I was not on record. I have been retained to deal with Justice B.S. Roy's ultra-virus order. But, Your Honor, the fact that I can't answer it does not mean we must assume that there is no challenge, because I believe that the peripheral challenge was made before Justice Bobby Drake. And I think that would be the only reason why Justice Bobby Drake said, look, my charging order is for the lump sum. I'm not extending my charging order to future payments. So why did Justice B.S. Roy undertake on his, own, on his own strength, on his own power? to say to Nissel, who was not a party and who may have raised all of these things, you've got to keep paying monthly sums in the future. I don't know, and with great respect, Your Honours, you don't know. So do we draw assumptions of fact adverse to Nissel because of the sympathetic argument made? 
or do we say, just as BSRI had no jurisdiction, the full bench was correct to so find, and therefore this appeal cannot succeed? Well, what we do is we look at the law, and of course Section 6.3 of the Order 45 of 2003 is part of the law. But one thing we do know is it is uh, a, a, a damning indictment of, of matters that 15 years have elapsed since uh, Mr. Ramsahoy got his judgment and is still struggling to enforce it. And ideally, we want to expedite it somehow or other to deal with these uh, issues rather than Your Honor, prolonged, and prolonged and prolonged and prolonged with all this filibustering. I agree with you fully, and I will, I will carry that as a standard bearer. But allow me to say that it's not black and white in that way for this reason. The lump sum payment has been paid. This is was subject to a charging order. The, Mr. Ramsoy had the power and was, had begun to go to the bank under cover of the order to say, pay me. And therefore, he was paid the majority, which is the lump sum of $36 million, not an insignificant sum. So what was left is monthly sums. Now, Mr. Ramsoy has been paid monthly sums for the last 10 years because of Justice B.S. Roy's erroneous order. So, so, sorry, are you saying, sorry, are you saying he has been paid since 2009? The yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so, he, so he's been paid the, up to the discharge of the Court of Appeal order, is that what you're saying? The order of the up to the discharge that of B.S. Roy J.'s order, yes, That would have been 2018. Yes, that was a, a little while ago. Okay. But in the meantime, cumul cumulatively, 2,000 U.S. a year for 10 years has been, a month for 10 years has been paid to him. Your Honor, I don't know if he can pay that back if we succeed, but that must be a consideration that Justice Bobble Drake had when he said I'm not ordering future payments. A stay of execution must consider when you have an accumulating judgment, if at the end of 10 years, can you repay that accumulated amount? We know that Mr. Ramsay isn't putting it in the bank to pay it back in the eventuality he loses, that he loses the appeal. So those factors are not before this court. Do you do justice if you say to Nissel, you've got to keep paying this money? And then when Nissel succeeds at the end of the day, we have no means of getting a recovery of our funds because Justice Bob Drake exercised his discretion on the facts before him and said only lump sum. Well, what I, what I don't understand, Mr. Jonas, is why Nissel allowed the, order, the appeal against the charge in order to just remain pending for these years. It's been, what, 10 with, years now? With great respect, Your Honor, when Justice B.S. Roy made his order, I applied to the full bench to discharge. That was all I could do procedurally. There is nothing else I can do. No, no, I'm not speaking of you. I'm not speaking of you, Mr. Jonas. I asked why did Nissel not do something? Didn't they file the appeal against the charge in order? Nissel filed the appeal and then asked Justice B.S. Roy for a stay. Justice B.S. Roy refused the stay. But when Justice B.S. Roy made his order, as a matter of procedure, when he made his order as a Justice of Appeal, sitting in chambers under Order 2, Rule 16, Nissel had no further recourse. They suddenly couldn't, certainly couldn't go to a first instance just to say, Justice B.S. Roy did something wrong, please fix it. All they could do is go to the full bench of the Court of Appeal, and unfortunately, that motion, which was filed promptly after Justice B.S. Roy's order, has taken all this time to come up. Nissel had no other recourse. There was nothing else Nissel could do. We had to sit and wait. So to lay it at the feet of Nissel to say, why didn't you do anything? Nissel has done everything in his power. And what came up before the Court of Appeal, which somewhat sheepishly set aside the order, is that after eight years, knowing that these monthly payments had been made, all the Court of Appeal could have done is set it aside. I, for me, I would have asked the Court of Appeal to order the repayment of the monies. But that would have opened a whole new kind of world. In the effort to do justice, Your Honors, if you have an imperfect um, account of the facts, you run a great danger. And therefore, I would respectfully urge you to, based on what has been said before you, to acknowledge you have an imperfect account of the facts before you. You do not know on what basis Justice Bobble Drake confined his order, the charging order only, to a lump sum. But you do know, because you have before you the affidavits which were before Justice B.S. Roy, and you do know as a matter of clear law that Justice B.S. Roy did not have the jurisdiction to make the orders he made. Since 1983, throughout the West Indies, it has been absolutely clear, as Your Honor said, as, as Mr. Justice Burgess said, um, in the Jamaica Gleaner case, 
from Reed Budni Farouk in 1983, 36 West Senior Report, they are all cited by Justice Summing in Caribbean Chemicals, which definitively said a justice of appeal sitting as a single judge in chambers doesn't have inherent jurisdiction. He's a preacher of statute. He sits there for specific purposes as an administrative matter for the convenience of the court, because you don't convene three judges to hear an application for an extension of time to appeal the general matter. Your Honours, um, that being said, there are two points I, I wish to draw your attention to, please. I am very glad that Justice Hayton began this conversation by dealing with the merits rather than the procedural objection which I have taken. I will say very respectfully that difficult cases sometimes um, cause difficult decisions. And if your honors felt unequivocally that you knew the road to justice, it may have been easy to say, I don't like your argument on the procedural question. We need to do justice. But I hope that I have convinced your honors that you do not have the factual wherewithal at this stage, the information factually, to satisfactorily assure yourself that by cutting through all all the niceties of legal process, you will be do, achieving justice, that all that can be done at this stage is to send, is to say to the parties, wait for your appeal to be heard. Because Justice B.S. I didn't have the um, power to make the order he made. No great injustice has been done because the bulk of the judgment has already been paid, and for 10 years, Mr. Ramsoy has received a monthly sum, and we don't know if he can pay it back. That on itself would be grounds for a stay. So let us, I hope that your honors are persuaded that the justice of this case is actually in favor of saying no. What was done should not have been done, and we will not interfere. Therefore, hopefully with a clean palate, we can consider what I consider to be an important procedural point. Before I go there, please, my friend. Yes, sir. Right, I, was, I was wondering if you were finished on that point and wanted to move on to Section 8 and Rule 1012. <laughs> Your Honor, most, most of the questions on the substantive point have, have come from you. And if there is any further question, please allow me to invite you to ask it now so that I can answer it to the best of my ability. No, no further questions. So you're faced with uh, Rule 1012, <laughs> Section 8, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, sir. Before I go to Rule 10, can I please invite Your Honor to have regard to Section 26 of the Substantive Court of Appeal Act? Um, to which my friend had adverted Your Honor's attention concerning the power of a single justice of appeal. There are five powers specifically listed. Now, I, I know that I don't need to say to this court that rules don't give jurisdiction. Rules tell you procedurally how to exercise your jurisdiction. So that the power, the jurisdiction which a single judge, who is not a court, he's a single judge has, is defined and its parameters are set out by Section 26, not by the rule. The five powers, leave to appeal, 26.1a, extend the time for the notice of appeal, 26.1b, assign legal aid, allow appellant to be present, and admit him to bail. Now, my friends have invited your honors to observe that issues of legal aid may extend the power of a single judge beyond what is contemplated in Order 2, Rule 16. But that is, in fact, fallacious, with great respect to my friend. Under our system, the last three issues, C, D, and E, deal with the criminal jurisdiction of the Court of Appeal. So that, in fact, if your honors have regard to order three of the sub subsidiary to the Court of Appeal Act, your honors will observe that order three rule 13 speaks to legal aid to appellants as part of the criminal process because of course in the criminal jurisdiction a, a, a defendant must have legal representation, he's entitled to it constitutionally. So that in fact, in terms of the civil jurisdiction, the civil jurisdiction power given to a single judge by Section 26. It is my respectful view, and, and this may sound revolutionary, because for so many years we have been playing blind homage to Order 2, Rule 16. 
The self act or the two rule 16 goes beyond the power of section 26 of section 1 and 2. I'm not going to break a lance on it on this occasion, but I wish to make the observation that the power of a justice of appeal sitting in chambers in a civil proceeding is very, very narrow under Order 2 Rule 16. And if you construe Order 2 Rule 16 in light of the substantive enactment in Section 27, there is absolutely no doubt that that last call in Order 2 Rule 16, any other interlocutory order must be construed a justum generis. As Justice Cummings found in Caribbean Chemicals, as was found in Jamaica Glena, and as was found in Reeve Boudni Farouk's case cited by Justice Cummings in her in her um, very thorough decision. This is in the Caribbean Chemicals case, please. So I, I wish to um, debunk what was suggested that, that the power is somehow wider. I really believe the power needs to be construed narrowly and has been correctly construed that way for the last 40 years. Now, Your Honor, going to section 6, 7, and 8. Right. With a clean palette, I hope, sir. If I can refer you, please. I, I noted it, it was strangely appropriate that the first case that came to the Caribbean court had to do with libel action in a Calypso song. I, I, um, I quoted the, the reservation which the great De La Bastide had in, in assessing sections 6, 7, and 8 and, and how, how he tried <clears throat> to construe them complementary to each other. With great respect to Justice de la Bastide, I think that he was absolutely correct when he concluded that the words subject to section 8, I'm sorry, subject to section 7, where they appear in section 8, do not constrain an applicant to go to this court to leave under section 7 first. Justice de la Bastille gave three very good reasons why it cannot be construed that way, because no such, provision, no such procedures provided in the criminal jurisdiction, and, <coughs> I'm sorry, because the time frames do not permit, and with great respect to him, there is absolutely no doubt, and this court has consistently held since the Barbados Rediffusion case, that you can come straight to this court to leave under Section 8. However, the words subject to Section 7 remain and they need to be construed. Justice Dr. Bastide, and, and with respect to him, I, I put in my submission with some unease, and I believe that it could only have been suggested with some unease, suggested it was a typographical error. Right now we are working with the benefit of hindsight. We have had decisions from this court that deal with situations such as Barbados diffusion decided that you can go, you can apply straight to this court under Section 8 without going to Section, to the Court of Appeal under Section 7 first. We have had decisions where an applicant went as of right under Section 6 to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal wrongly refused leave, and the applicant then came to the court, to this court under Section 8. And this court said, we have an inherent jurisdiction to fix this thing. Again, with great respect, absolutely correctly in my view. The facts of this case have presented an entirely new situation. And with great respect, I believe this is the situation that pertains to those magic words subject to Section 7. You see, in my respectful view, when Parliament is drafting, when, when the experts, on whom the very inexpert occupants of Parliament, are drafting. Those experts contemplate that things should be done as they are setting out in their act. In Section 6, they say you have a right to appeal, and you come to the Court of Appeal who exercises a gatekeeping function, and once you've got the right, once the value is over a million dollars, the Court of Appeal has no discretion to say no. So as soon as the Court of Appeal said no, it acted wrongly, and that formed the basis of an appeal to, to the Caribbean Court. The Caribbean Court has heard such applications and in its inherent jurisdiction, correctly, I say with great respect, has decided we are sweeping aside all 
procedural issues and because the Court of Appeal acted wrongly, we are giving you leave to appeal. We are acting under our inherent jurisdiction on Section 8. We have had the situation where the Court of Appeal wrongly gave leave to appeal as of right, as in the Dipcon case. So the Court of Appeal erroneously under Section 6 said, yes, you have leave to appeal as of right. And this Court in Dipcon says, sorry, the Court of Appeal was wrong, therefore you're not properly here and we don't have jurisdiction. And the only way we will hear you in the exercise of our inherent jurisdiction is if you satisfy the test that an egregious error of law is clearly visible that we need to fix. What is apparent on the facts of this case is something which has not yet come before the Court. It is a situation where the Court of Appeal heard an application to appeal as of right. And the Court of Appeal correctly said, there's no as of right appeal here. It's not worth a million dollars. This is a procedural issue you're claiming. So the appeal, the Court of Appeal struck it out. And what the applicant did is the applicant assumed that it had the right to come under Section 8 as if it had properly applied using the Section 8 criteria and being refused by the Court of Appeal. And I think that is what Parliament has not contemplated should be done. But is there a right whether the Court of Appeal is correct under Section 6 or not to come under Section 8? But the weakness of coming under Section 8, of course, is you've got to show miscarriage of justice, realistic possibility of success and so on. But why shouldn't you be allowed to come under Section 8 if the Court of Appeal is right or wrong? Because you don't know whether it's right or wrong, of course, until you come to us and we determine it. Because in my respectful view, sir, the time limits which are set by the rules contemplate that you went under Section 7 to the Court of Appeal saying that this is an important matter. And the Court of Appeal said, no, it's not important. And the rules contemplate that when that happens, you then have 21 days to come to this Court to say, look, this is an important matter. This is not an appeal, as the LOP case has properly said. But please, in the exercise of your discretion, give me leave to appeal. Your time frame for doing that is 21 days from the refusal of the Court of Appeal under a Section 7 application. That is why the word in Section 8, subject to Section 7, appear. It is where you feel you have an important appeal. You go to the Court of Appeal saying this thing is important. And the Court of Appeal says it's not. And you then have 21 days under the rules to come to this Court to say this is something important. But where you have not even said, and on the application that was made in this case, the Court of Appeal was not approached with the suggestion that the issues are important. The Court of Appeal was approached as of right when there was no as of right appeal. That does not contemplate when the Court of Appeal says, no, this thing is not as of right. That does not contemplate a second bite of the cherry on grounds which are mutually exclusive, irrelevant to as of right, that this is a serious and important appeal. That is not what Parliament wants. Yes, sir. Counsel, sorry. Why should an applicant lose his right because he wrongly applied on the Section 6? Why should he be in such a violently different position from a person who applies on the Section 7 but who does not succeed on the Section 7? What justifies the differentiation that you are arguing for? Why should a Section 6 person, if he can show, for instance, that there would be a grave miscarriage of justice, why shouldn't he be able to come on to Section 8? The criteria which are set out in the Act itself, sir. The criteria which are set out in Section 6 tell you when you can appeal as of right. Yes, admittedly. Admittedly. So you've applied on the Section 6. Wrongly. Wrongly. Yes. But you still are in danger of suffering a grave miscarriage of justice. Why can't you apply to this Court on the Rule 8 to say... Your Honor, I believe... I'm sorry, sir. ...to say, give me special leave? Your Honor, I believe that you can, but I believe you would have to ask for an extension of time to make that application because time does not run. That 21 days does not run for these purposes. That 21 days runs, in the words of Section 8, subject to Section 7, the 21 days runs from the time the Court of Appeal refuses you on your application under Section 7. 
I do not believe that the, the tenor of the legislation contemplates mm -hmm. that you go as of right, and then if you're not as of right, you then have a right to go without an extension of time on an entirely new ground, a Section 7 ground. <laughs> section 7 and Section 8 are complementary where this is concerned, and that is why those important words exist in Section 8, subject to Section 7. If I go to the Court of Appeal and say this is important, and the Court of Appeal disagrees, this Court, under Section 8, I have 21 days to come to this Court to ask the same question. This is important. But the structure of those three sections does not contemplate that I go wrongly as of right, and then have 21 days to come under a different ground. But you, I don't believe that the structure sorry, contemplates but you, you, that. You, you, you will remember that uh, Lord Reed, in a, in a famous uh, case, pointed to the fact that the court sometimes must do violence to words to procure justice. To, this is statutory language. It may involve doing violence. I mean, the argument, you, I, I see your argument that uh, subject to Section 7 uh, implies that 21, day, 21 days after that decision, there is there's no subject to Section 6, so therefore the 42 days should, should apply. Uh, isn't that a, isn't that a a very, very stringent argument. Particularly in the light of Rule 1012 in the CCJ rules. Forgive me, sir. I'm, I'm attacked on all sides. Let me find you with 1012. Please allow me to explore this use of the language, and I'm glad you've referred us to just um, or the ten sir. Reading from the third line, in cases in which leave to appeal has been sought from the court below, we must infer and refuse, because if you believe to appeal has been granted, you don't come again. In cases in which leave to appeal has been sought from the court below, within 21 days of the refusal or rescission of such leave. Your Honor, this Parliament, when Parliament drafts this, I, I'm sorry, can I go on, sir? Yes. Thank you. When Parliament drafted this, Parliament was not contemplating a situation where you go as of right, where the Court of Appeal is a gatekeeper only, and the Court of Appeal messes up its job and refuses you as of right. Parliament is contemplating the situation where you go under Section 7, and the Court of Appeal, in a proper assessment of the facts, says this thing is not important. And then, within 21 days, you come to this Court. Because there is no possibility of a refusal if you're as of right. There is no legal possibility of a refusal. So are you? the only way to construe this otherwise is to say that Parliament is contemplating here that there will be a refusal in a situation under Section 6 where you have no right to refuse. I think we follow you, um, Council. I suppose the next question is, well, um, what happens in this kind of situation? Because you are presenting a very, if I may say so, a very interesting interpretation of, of those sections. Um, one which I don't think has been articulated um, here before. So, assuming that you were correct, um, I, I assume that the other side would wish to at this rather um, late stage seek an extension of, of time. And given the novelty of your argument, I, I am, I'm assuming that you do not object to, to such a request? Your Honor, I'm, when you use the word interesting, I, I had a teacher in high school, when he used the word interesting, it was usually followed by a detention. <laughs> um, having said that, there's no detention in, in contemplation <laughs> at all. I think it's a fascinating <laughs> way of looking at the sections, yes. Well, having said that, and given the overall context of this argument, if your honors decide that there is an egregious miscarriage of justice, and my submission say this, you have the power, of course, under the Mohan and Fassad case, you, you've ex exercised that power before, you have the power to prevent an egregious miscarriage of justice by keeping it all aside. So I don't believe, with great respect, that you would even need to invite the other side to ask for an extension of time at this, at this point. 
I think that if there's an egregious miscarriage of justice here, <coughs> you can sweep it all away. With great respect, I've already argued why I don't believe you can come to that conclusion. You have insufficient facts, and Justice B.S. Wright was wrong. But to answer your question, if, if we were to condescend to great technicality, certainly this court could invite the other side to apply for an extension of time at this stage. But this court did not do that in the Dipcon case. And in the Dipcon case, the Attorney General had much greater cause to confidently rely on the assurance given by the Court of Appeal that he had leave to appeal as of right. The Court of Appeal had granted the order. And in the Dipcon case, this court didn't say, well, given that you were lured into a false sense of security by the Court of Appeal, we will give you an extension of time. So I, with great respect, I believe that the better alternative in your exercises of jurisdiction, and, and your I do not presume to sit in that very uncomfortable chair, but in your exercise of discretion would be to say there's an egregious miscarriage of justice on the horizon, we are fixing it. And I think Your Honor could do that. But um, not in this case, Your Honor, with great respect. Okay. Right. So, the rest of your case there then, Mr. Jones? <laughs> yes, please, sir, unless I can be of any yeah, further it's assistance. It's a good please. place to rest, I think. Yes. <laughs> right. So, so Mr. Could I, could, could I, uh, President, could I just raise one slight point with Mr. Jonas? So, you're inviting us to decide the case in a fairly narrow basis that um, Justice of Appeal Roy was incorrect and the Court of Appeal um, was, in fact, correct in, um, in, in overturning the orders he, he gave. Uh, now, if we did that, and I understand why you say we should do that, that is the remit in this case, um, how does that advance the litigation? Any? Because we still have to wait for some time for the matter to be heard by the Court of Appeal. They've waited, what, nine years? And if this morning, you, if this morning we simply say, well, you know, Mr. Jonas is correct, um, BS Roy ought not to issue those orders, we are back to looking at the clock. And, and, and Thank we, you, sir. Is there anything in your view that, that we could do to seek to assist the process coming to some sort of finality? Thank you, sir. I, I, had, I had actually intended to, to, make the, to make the observation on my own, and it had slipped me. Um, I have been dodging bullets. But um, with great respect, we have a malaise in our country. Your Honours have mentioned it um, on several occasions, and you're justified in doing so. And I understand entirely your reluctance to wash your hands of it and to send it back into the muddy water of the Demerara. But one thing that I have noticed, and our system has improved tremendously after we have been exposed to the light of the CCJ. Internationally, we don't, we don't bear embarrassment very well. And if the court to say that it has no doubt that the substantive appeal will be heard within the next six months. I rather suspect that the substantive appeal will be heard within the next six months. Sorry, why do you go as far as six? Why not three? <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> we have an eternal lot I, I don't presume. I don't presume on your greater wisdom, sir. No, I, I am presuming on your better knowledge of realities. <laughs> Quite so. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Jonas. So, Mr. Satram, now your turn no, nothing, to reply. No, nothing by way of reply, Your Honor. Thank you. Right. Well, uh, in that event, uh, we'll, uh, re we'll adjourn and we'll uh, reserve our judgment, I think, in view of some of the interesting points uh, that uh, have emerged and uh, let you know in due course when the Reserve judgment is ready. Very good. Much obliged.